everyone, I'm Rena Jana. I'm a Googler based here in New York, and I'm the editor of the Pair Guidebook. Hi everyone, I'm Mahima Pushkarna. I'm a designer at the People Plus AI Research based out of the Boston Cambridge offices and super excited to be here. Yeah, we're really thrilled to give you a sneak preview of the generative AI updates to this guidebook. And just to backtrack a little bit, a pair, I'll explain what it is. It is a very intentionally fun and playful acronym for the People Plus AI Research Initiative here at Google. It brings together machine learning researchers and UX designers to explore the partnership between people and AI. So about five years ago, half a decade ago, about 100 of us in this initiative came together. Mahima and I were two of them. And we decided to share our, what we've been experiencing, what we've been seeing. And not just share it with each other internally, but, but share it with the world to provide practical guidance and best practices for designing human-centered AI products. And that is the core of the Pair Guidebook. It remains evergreen. And we centered on these six topics that are essential to begin thinking about that people-centric view of building AI. Everything from what might seem really basic, but it's important to think about at the beginning, your user needs. How are you going to define success? Really thinking about data collection and how to do that responsibly. Going through mental models. Building trust through explainability practices. Really thinking about mechanisms for feedback and control. You saw that in some of the, the BARD UI that you probably use and that you saw explained today. And then really also thinking about failures and how to deal with that gracefully. So these remain evergreen, although this was published externally almost five years ago. But as you know, um, there's been a lot of exciting advancements in, in research and product as well. Also, there's been a lot of external interest in this people-centric approach. Even though we haven't fully updated the guidebook yet, we're going to give you a preview of that now, uh, we've seen spikes in interest in this guidance. The number of people coming to the Pair Guidebook has gone up exponentially. Just in six months alone, between February and August, you can see how many more people, tens of thousands of more people, maybe you're some of them, have come for this guidance. So we decided to expand our sources and make sure that we're addressing all of the needs that we know are bubbling up with generative AI and, you know, quite honestly, with all of the questions that you've asked today. And so some of our new sources are our AI principles reviews. You've heard about the AI principles in the previous um, presentation, but we've been looking at these reviews for patterns of risks that generative AI surface as well as the interventions and mitigations that are consistent across many of these reviews. These reviews actually focus on product implementations of many of the research models that you read about in papers and that you've heard about today. We also um, have conducted speculative design workshops internally. So imagining futures that only generative AI can create. And then also we have workshops on a moral imagination approach, working with philosophers, ethicists, et cetera, with product teams to, to think about this from a responsible point of view. And then finally, we know we can't do this alone. So we've been working across the AI ecosystem and really intentionally with partners from a diversity of backgrounds. So we're working with our Equitable AI Research Roundtable here at Google, bringing in domain experts um, in areas such as law, education, social justice, and community engagement. And then also we have a, an ongoing relationship with um, Google for Startups, with the global alumni of founders, as well as working really closely with black and Latino founders of AI startups. So I'm going to hand it over to Mahima to tell you a little bit about what we've found. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rina. So as we looked at all six chapters of the guidebook, we realized this update's not going to look equal across everything. First off, we've significantly expanded the first two chapters, user needs and defining success in data and model evolution. As you can imagine, generative AI has reduced the barriers to prototyping now. So bringing model evolution early into the conversation and also understanding problems in deeper, uh, in deeper ways, in ways that they affect actually more diverse populations all across the globe, that's an enhanced focus over here. Uh, with everything else, we're actively learning a ton about the landscape. There are all these internal summits, active researchers going, uh, you know, who are working with generations, multi-generational research, but also specific implementations of our various model. 
So we're treating this update more as a living, breathing document, one that's going to evolve as we uncover more. And this update is going to be introducing specifically a ton of new concepts, concepts that might seem a little far out for machine learning teams because they're grounded in human-centered design, but concepts that also feel new to UX teams so that they now have a greater seat at the table and we can represent users better across the product development process. The next big shift that we're seeing is we're introducing guidance that can then help us deliver responsible AI products for developers and expert user workflows. So whether you're a doctor or you're um, you know, somebody who's in the auditing schema, we wanna make sure that you know, there's something there when you're designing for productivity for people like that. Finally, we wanna take a more future-facing approach. So instead of just helping teams react to what they're seeing, we're gonna help them uh, anticipate and mitigate near future challenges at scale. We're doing this by introducing two new hypothetical applications, which are designed exclusively. These are not real products. These are just designed to show off all the concepts that we have in there and also put our guidance into work. Um, these organize design principles around critical product decisions, highlighting generative AI specific considerations for each design principle. We're also offering multiple approaches because we know that there's no single size that fits everybody. And our goal here is to support cross-functional product decision-making so that you can see the solutions that you need in these hypothetical applications. And then I'm gonna walk you through three big takeaways for people-centric generative AI coming out of this guidebook. So this is all brand new material and we're really excited about it. So the first thing that we learned was because of generative AI, we now need to deal with open-ended scenarios. We have these models that are capable of doing so many different things. So traditional design of working with single tasks is sort of a paradigm that's gonna be shifting soon. So our first big takeaway is that we wanna help people establish interaction design policies. Because generative AI models can do so many things, we found that product teams were really trying to understand what it meant to design for these vast open-ended design scenarios. So as we looked at the guidebook as a whole, we realized there was this one golden thread woven through all our chapters that could encourage both machine learning and UX teams to make well-considered design, product design decisions collaboratively, and these are interaction design policies. This is one thing that I hope you walk away with from in this new guidebook. It's this notion of interaction design policies. These are a set of criteria that govern the user's experience at a point in the user's journey when they interact with the generative AI system. These policies define how the product responds to different inputs from the user, how the user can safely navigate different model outcomes. And with that said, let's systematically navigate through one such interaction design policy. The very first part of an interaction design policy are what we call acceptable actions. What are things that are safe for the model to perform, right? Think of it as framing this as we want users or people to do what? Let's say I want to draft content that's centered around gender because my best friend's getting married, this is a celebration for the bride, but we want it to be inclusive. Now let's add one more layer of complexity because as we saw with SGEs, there's a lot that we can do with a single query. Say I want to draft uh, an invitation for um, a Mandy ceremony, which is a very popular bride-oriented cultural celebration in, in Southeast Asia. So what do we not want over here, right? That's the next stage. What are unacceptable use cases or tasks that the AI system shouldn't perform regardless of what the person asks the AI system to say? So we don't want users to even accidentally draft offensive content or content that promotes gender-based stereotypes or engages in cultural caricaturing, even if playfully so. This brings us to the third part of the anatomy, which is thresholds of uncertainty. At the end of the day, generative AI systems are predictive models. These are not hard and fast. So our question is, what are thresholds of uncertainty or confidence above which AI outcomes can be surfaced to users? Frame this as a simple, our users won't mind correcting a few words here and there, as long as they don't need to rewrite the entire invitation. But then we also know that generative AI systems pose risks, right? So this is a moment for us to pause and think about what are the different types of errors that models can produce. And then we can weigh these based on corresponding risks that users might be vulnerable to. For example, People and their guests at this event, they might be harmed if they get content that is offensive to them or culturally stereotypes them and a whole risk of slews. Because each of these can be framed as simple people-focused statements, this can inform the development of both product decisions and front-end interfaces, but also establish machine learning requirements. 
But the one thing that we've learned is that the best interaction design policies are those that are crafted from research with people. Which brings me to the next big takeaway. People first always, not technology first. When we're approaching AI problems, we need to strike a balance between a people's first approach and a technology first approach. And this means that we need a deep understanding of users' needs. A people's first approach starts with identifying real, uh, real problems that people need help with. This requires articulating and validating our assumptions about what problems, for whom, what kinds of problems are we going to solve, in which contexts. A technology first approach, on the other hand, starts with exploring the capabilities and limitations of various models or technologies. And this is great, because sometimes this might look like an under the hood improvement, delivering a prediction faster, reducing latency, things that we've all heard up, up front and center being discussed today. It's worth remembering that we need a balance between these two because both can result in great product design that people love if the needs that are met are significant and the solutions do this effectively. Talking to people, looking at data, and observing behaviors can help us balance our thinking between people first and technology first. This is important because people experience the same problem in a multitude of ways, at different frequencies and at different moments in their lives. For example, People from communities that have been historically marginalized are going to experience problems in very different and very unique ways. So the very first step that we're proposing out here is to verify that you're actually solving the correct problem and validate your framing with a diverse set of users. Then a thorough understanding of the problem space can help you if and how to use generative AI to solve your problems. We'll need to ask questions like, how pervasive is the problem that we're trying to solve? What socio-technical drivers are involved? And how are they likely to impact the users who, who are experiencing the problem? What's the frequency, the context, the severity, the key triggers? But also, problems are never the same. They evolve over time. They respond and they adapt. How are we going to deal with that? To that end, some of the content in the pair guidebook guides us towards identifying the intersection of user needs and AI strengths, understanding the nature of problems, but then also understanding how people with lived experiences frame these problems. This is where we get into participatory methods. Knowing fully well that some solutions might exist, it's important that we understand what are different workarounds and ad hoc methods that people already adapt to solve these problems before we jump into creating AI-driven solutions over here. This brings us to finally and very carefully considering how AI can add unique value in that solution. But problem framing for today isn't enough. And the pace of change requires that we factor in the, uh, our probable and plausible futures into our solutions. To that end, we borrowed from speculative and critical design practices to help product teams anticipate the networked and at scale effects of technologies and trends across our lives. We found that methods like this, the futures wheel, uh, with these kinds of methods, teams are able to more clearly articulate the kinds of futures they want to enable five, six, even 10 years out, but also the kinds of futures we don't want to enable grounding all of this in people's everyday lived experience, driving more responsible AI practices. I know we're over time, but I'm going to quickly blast through the best part, which we've been saving for the end, all right? which is planning for model evolution. I alluded to this earlier in the presentation. Generative AI, especially product, uh, products like Makersuite, have brought, have brought down the barrier to prototyping with generative AI systems to such low levels that now UX teams, machine learning teams, everyone, can prototype with machine learning models. And this is really exciting, because if you've decided to use a language-driven or a generative AI system, you'll find that it takes significantly less time to validate your ideas, and you can put them in, right in front of your users. So this actually helps us determine feasibility of ideas and also helps set expectations around data needs, which means that we can actually prototype our data. I'm going to pause here for just a second, because prototyping your data is not something that we typically hear about in product design systems. But what this actually does is helps, it helps us anticipate in the wild input data. We can actually see what real world data looks like when we put these small prototypes with generative AI into the hands of our users, and that can inform product decisions. We can use that to see how our models respond and define standards for high quality data, which means what does high quality data look like for our product, and then we create plans for training and tuning our models. It also helps us refine our test data, understand what kinds of prompts actually reflect real-world use cases, and evaluate the kinds of models that we create. And finally, it helps us plan for adversarial tests, right? such as in the AI security realm. This can look like prompt attacks, 
training data extraction, backdooring the model, data poisoning, and exfiltration. And it also helps us conduct adversarial tests with, uh, with our trusted testers, so we actually see what, do, what does the real world impact look like. All of this goes on to one thing. We want to create solid foundations for meaningful generative AI experiences. By prototyping our data and our models early on, we now get to actually testing how UX interventions can ensure a safe and meaningful experience for users all across the world, regardless of where they are. Each time we test our prototype, that's an opportunity for us to build our intuition for evaluating AI systems in our products. So with that, please feel free to follow us on our Medium channel. We're going to be posting a ton of content over there. Um, and the guidebook is available. The old version of the guidebook, which we're, which we're going to roll out very soon, the new version, is available at pair.withgoogle.com slash guidebook. Yeah, importantly, we want to hear from you. Um, we know that you are the future of research and generative AI and AI and many different technologies. So please get in touch with us. This is how you can get in touch with us. We'd love to get feedback on the current guidebook and some of the ideas that we shared with you today. It's important to build this together. All right. Thank you. Thank you.